Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the morning session. And I'm very, I'm Kyungsung Lee working at IMSA. And I'm very happy to introduce Professor Engel. And he will continue his lecture comparing geometric and hot theoretic compactifications. Uh, thank you again for the uh, opportunity to speak. Um, so last time I uh, talked about uh, degenerations of abelian varieties and how um, they can be used to prove. Um, so you can prove that there's a geometric compactification of the moduli space. Um, the moduli space of stable pairs containing um, like a principally polarized abelian variety with its theta divisor. Um, and that is, in fact, up to normalization equal to one of the toroidal compactifications, the second Voronoi compactification. So I now want to discuss a sort of analog for K3 surfaces. Um, so let's just start with the definition of a K3 surface. So it's a compact, complex surface with trivial canonical bundle and um, H1 of x equal to 0. And so um, a theorem of uh, CU is that, in fact, um, any such surface is Kähler. And um, I think that uh, Kadaira proved that uh, they're all deformation equivalent, at least uh, in the complex world. Um, so, in fact, they're all diffeomorphic. So, um, to describe them, like the topological invariants of a K3 surface, um, we sort of um, just have one, you know, surface up to diffeomorphism that we're working with. So, uh, we have that the second cohomology of X, this has, um, it has the intersection form, which is a symmetric bilinear unimodular form um, just by general um, principles. It's even because the canonical bundle is trivial by Wu's formula and by the Hodge index, uh, Hodge signature, Gertzberg signature theorem or the Hodge index theorem, um, its signature is 319. And uh, so a theorem of Serre uh, states that, you know, an indefinite unimodular lattice is uniquely determined by its signature and whether it's even or odd. So in fact, H2 of XZ is isometric to the unique even unimodular lattice of signature 319. So this is the even unimodular lattice of signature 319. Um, okay, so uh, since we're going to be talking about algebraic geometry, we'll want our K3s to be polarized, which is to say that they have an ample line bundle L um, on them. And we say that the polarization is of degree 2D if L squared equals 2D, where this is really shorthand for C1 of L um, in H2, then squared with respect to the intersection form. Um, okay, so uh, that's the integral cohomology is uh, this even unimodular lattice with C1 of L, some element of it. Um, the complex cohomology has the Hodge decomposition um, of dimension profile um, 121. Uh, with H20 uh, spanned by uh, the class of a non vanishing holomorphic two form. And so um, the theorem of Piotrowski and Shapiro, or Piotrowski Shapiro and Shafarevich, is that um, it, I used to think, like when I was a grad student, that Piotrowski and Shapiro were two people um, because it's like always hyphenated as Piotrowski Shapiro Shafarevich. And I was like, oh, it's a three author paper. Um, and so it sort of sunk into, my, I eventually learned the fact that Piedowski Shapiro is one person, but um, actually uh, Shepard Barron, 
Um, I don't know if Nick is here, but I also thought that you were two people. Um, <laughs> I'm one person, I promise you. <laughs> um, again, because, you know, uh, but your name appears in the middle of a four term hyphenated sequence of names and it's um, <laughs> so it's uh, yeah it's it's an easy mistake to make we need a different symbol other than hyphen to put between the authors, maybe a slash would be a good one. Um, okay, so. Uh, it's uh, the Torelli theorem for K3 surfaces states that two K3s are isomorphic if and only if you can identify this linear algebraic data of the integral cohomology together with um, the uh, Hodge decomposition. So it says that they're isomorphic if and only if there's an isometry phi uh, from H of X Z to H of X prime Z. So this is an isometry, just not just an isomorphism, but isometry for the cup product such that the image of the line spanned by the holomorphic two form is sent to the line spanned by the holomorphic two form. And then we can ask, well, how does a polarization play into this? Well, if we have a polarization, we'll also want um, that phi of the line bundle L on X is um, the line bundle L, the class of the line bundle L prime on X prime. So now what I wanna do is I wanna fix uh, a vector V in the uh, unimodular lattice that models the K3 lattice, which is primitive and has square 2D. And I, and I introduced the following notations. So let's let D be the so-called period domain. So this is gonna play the role that Ziegel upper half space played for AG, um, but uh, it's played by D for K3 surfaces. So it's all the vectors in, the projectivization of all vectors in the complexification of the lattice, which satisfy these three conditions. And so you should sort of be noting here that if you take omega wedge omega and integrate it against X, that's zero. If you integrate omega wedge omega bar, you get something positive. And uh, the integral of uh, omega wedge C1 of L against X is zero because C1 of L will be a one one form and omega is a two zero form. And now we define um, gamma to be the subgroup of the isometries of 319, which fixed this distinguished fixed vector V. And um, a corollary of the Torelli theorem is plus the uh, theorem of Todorov that the um, period mapping is surjective, is that the moduli space of polarized K3 surfaces is in fact this arithmetic quotient um, F2D equal to D mod gamma. Um, so this is a this is a Hermitian symmetric domain. People say is a Hermitian um, symmetric domain of type uh, four or of type uh, SO two n. So in this case, SO two nineteen is the relevant group, and sorry, I have some allergies, and. Um, Gamma is an arithmetic subgroup of that real group. Okay, so the question is given a family of degenerating polarized K3s, how does the period mapping, so I should say, well, what is the period mapping? Um, well, I just send, uh, I use a fixed, uh, some isometry uh, to send H2 of XZ to this unimodular lattice. And then I see where the line, um, spanned by the class of omega goes. And it goes into D, but it's ambiguous up to post-composition by an element of gamma, a change of marking. Okay. And so uh, given a family of degenerating polarized K3s, how does the period mapping degenerate? So the answer is as uh, in abelian varieties, there's a distinguished isotropic sublattice of 
um, v perp. So this rel this lattice v perp, we could have just written this condition up here as x is in v perp tensored with c. So v perp is really the relevant lattice here. Um, so and maybe you know this is the lattice which is uh, signature. This lattice has signature two nineteen because we took the perp of a positive norm vector. Um, Okay, so there's sort of because it's a rank 219 lattice, an isotropic lattice can only have rank one or rank two. And sort of I uh, drew some geometric pictures of degenerating K3s here. Um, okay, so there's the rank one case, which is what we're going to focus on. And then um, the rank two case is um, we're not going to look at it exactly, but so the, the sort of difference between the rank one and the rank two case is like that this is sort of, um, this is the so-called uh, maximally unipotent degeneration. Um, and another way of phrasing it is that um, in the degeneration, uh, the central fiber is like sort of as singular as possible. So it has um, the singular stratification of the central fiber will always have zero strata. Um, whereas uh, in the case of um, the rank of um, this um, isotropic lattice being two, there are models of the degeneration where um, there will be no zero strata of the singular stratification of the central fiber. And so um, I wanted to sort of just uh, connect this, like these two lattices to a sort of geometric picture. What's happening in, um, so these are called the so-called type three degenerations in K3 like literature. And these are these so-called uh, type two degenerations. Um, and what's happening in a type three degeneration is that there is a vanishing cycle associated to a zero stratum of the central fiber. And it's a sort of vanishing two torus. Um, and this vanishing two torus delta spans the isotropic lattice. So this delta is an isotropic vector. Um, this lattice is contained in V perp. I guess I wrote that above. And so this two torus is all collapsing to a single point is what's happening in the degeneration. Uh, in the type two degeneration, it's rather that there are sort of two linearly independent isotropic vectors in the lattice V perp. I'm calling them delta and lambda now. And instead of these two tori collapsing to isolated points in the central fiber, they collapse to circles inside of the singular locus, which is um, an elliptic curve. So that's sort of the picture. Um, so henceforth, we're gonna assume that the rank of this isotropic lattice is one. And this is nice because now we can normalize the holomorphic two form in a unique way so that the integral, um, I guess up to sine at least, so that the integral of this class delta um, against the holomorphic two form is equal to one. So we're normalizing for the non-zero T here, right? Because those are the fibers where we have a non-singular K3. Um, then we have this special central fiber. So then what we do is we take um, a basis, let's say gamma one through gamma 19 of delta perp mod delta. So, so since delta was isotropic, um, so delta was in V perp isotropic um, of signature 219. This delta perp mod delta has signature uh, 118. So it's a hyperbolic lattice of rank 19. And I take some basis of it, and then I can integrate um, the holomorphic two form against that basis. And so you might object, well, um, if I have this basis, you know, 
This, these are only elements of delta perp mod delta, right? So um, I would have to lift them into delta perp to integrate the two form. But if I lift them, then um, the lifts are ambiguous up to a multiple of delta. And I've conveniently normalized the holomorphic two form so that the integral against delta is one. And so what this shows is that these integrals are well-defined mod z, or in complex numbers mod z. And we know what kills mod z from the abelian variety case. We did the exact same thing. We took exp of two pi i of all of the periods um, mods that were well-defined mod z. So we can do this to these uh, 19 classes, and we get um, a torus embedding from the period domain. Um, so yeah, it's not an embedding of the domain. This was actually a mistake I wrote before, but really mod the unipotent. Um, subgroup stabilizing delta, so this is u sub delta, um, into c star to the 19. So this is the so-called torus embedding, and it'll play the same role that the torus embedding into c star to the g plus one, two, two did in, um, for compactifying abelian varieties. And again, an application of uh, Schmidt's nil potent orbit theorem will say that as t approaches zero, these periods, when we view them in this torus embedding, they get approximated by some um, co-character of the lattice. And so these CIs are in uh, C star, and we have T to the lambda one through T to the lambda 19. So these lambda one through lambda 19 are sort of measure the relative speeds at which these 19 periods are um, degenerating. Um, yeah. Okay, so now let's discuss models of degenerations. So um, it's a theorem of uh, Kulikov and Person Pinkham, beautiful theorem that you can make um, a degeneration into a particularly nice uh, form. So it's possible after finite base change and birational modifications uh, to, to ensure the following three properties, that X is smooth, the central fiber is um, simple normal crossings, or I guess people say reduced normal crossings nowadays. And the canonical bundle is trivial. So let me give you a non-example of a Kulikov um, degeneration. So sorry to person in Pinkham, but I uh, in this most recent paper with Valeri, we ended up calling them Kulikov degenerations. Um, maybe I should have, uh, I guess KPP would be a good term too. Um, but yeah, so um, consider, for instance, the most famous degeneration of um, K3s, this uh, Fermat degeneration of portics. So that is not an example. So the reason that is not exa an example is because one uh, fails for this. Um, so it is true that the central fiber is, is reduced normal crossings and the canonical bundle is trivial, um, but uh, this one, this smoothness fails. So there's an uh, easy way to rectify that, which is that um, this uh, threefold describing this degeneration is singular at exactly 24 points. So it's singular at the, um, so if you look at t equals zero, so t equals zero is a tetrahedron, right? So it's four planes P2 in um, a P3, and uh, each edge of the tetrahedron intersected with the residual cortic will give a singular point. And so we need to um, resolve that. And there is a small resolution of those 24 conifold singular points. So I've sort of drawn that heuristically in this picture here, where um, there's two choices for the conifold resolution. I can like do one, or I can do an atia flop to it. And um, so what I'm doing is I'm choosing to resolve two of them 
uh, on one component and two of them on the other component. And so what I end up with is, is a surface. So there are four components here. Uh, each component is isomorphic to the blow up of P2 at six points, um, where these six points are uh, two plus two plus two points uh, on three lines, L1 plus L2 plus L3. Okay, so now I want to uh, discuss like the general structure that I get um, on the dual complex of one of these degenerations. This observation is originally due to gross uh, hacking and keel. Um, and it was uh, used by, um, by myself uh, in my thesis. And it's a, it's a tool that I've used a lot in um, studying these K3 degenerations. So the observation is that the dual complex has away from its vertices, a so-called integral affine structure. So these are charts to R2, unique up to post-composition with um, this integral affine group. So I wanna sort of illustrate that integral affine structure. It's constructed by gluing fans. Okay, so I have a big Kulikov degeneration here. So, so this is an example of a of uh, the central fiber X naught of a Kulikov degeneration. And uh, each time an edge is unlabeled, so let, I'll say what the labels are in a second, but each time an edge is unlabeled, it means that both sides of the edge are labeled minus one. So uh, I didn't wanna crowd the picture too much, but there's labels minus one and minus one. So what do these labels mean? So each sort of region here, so first of all, this is a tiling of the sphere. Uh, that's the first observation. Second observation, each tile in here corresponds to, um, each tile corresponds to an irreducible component of the central fiber. And, um, and then what are the numbers along the sort of uh, boundaries of a tile those are the um, self intersections of a sequence of curves, of a cycle of curves. So, um, so each component um, is glued is glued to the others along um, a cycle of rational curves. And um, in fact, it's along an anti-canonical cycle. So a general fact about degenerations of Calabiaus is that um, a degeneration of Calabiao varieties is gonna be a union of varieties which are like log Calabiao. That is to say, um, they're gonna have like meromorphic two forms on them. And then the, the surfaces with meromorphic two forms are gonna be glued in such a way along their poles so that the residues agree. So that's sort of um, what a degeneration of Calabiaus looks like. And so this red is really the pole locus, right? Um, of the meromorphic two forms. Um, and then each sort of triple point is where three surfaces are glued. So in a simple normal crossing surface, you can have double curves and triple points, right? And so those are the triple points. So I said that there was an integral affine structure on the dual complex. This is not the dual complex. This is the intersection complex. Okay, so this picture here is a Cremona surface. So what I do is I essentially like take a fan of the Cremona surface like this, So that's the fan of the Cremona surface. And then I'm gonna glue those fans together of all of, the, of all of the surfaces. So let me try to do this by, okay, let's see. Okay, so there I glue together all of the fans of the various surfaces. So for instance, uh, we see that 
Um, so let me erase that. So we see that like here, we have the fan of the Cremona surface. And um, okay, so here's some toric surface and its fan has five primitive rays like that. Okay, so this, uh, this works perfectly fine at most of the vertices, uh, but there's an issue, which is that not all components uh, of this surface are toric, okay? So up to 24 of the components are non-toric. Um, so, so yeah, how do we sort of understand uh, these non-toric things? Well, Roughly, you, you sort of, there's a formula from toric geometry. If you have a toric surface, then um, the self-intersection of a double curve, well, let's say VD is toric, with D its toric boundary, then uh, DI squared is going to be, or minus DI squared times uh, the primitive integral vector VI associated to the edge of the fan is vi minus one plus vi plus one. So what you can sort of do is you can enforce this formula. So the, for instance, the Cremona surface, um, it's uh, anti-canonical cycle has all minus one curves. And that is reflected in the fact that like say this v1 plus v3 is one times v2. So you just sort of enforce the same formula locally at one of these surfaces. And when the surface isn't toric, it forces there to be some sort of SL2Z monodromy of the affine structure. So this is the analog now. So this is our analog uh, to discuss the sort of comparison to abelian varieties. This is the analog of the Mumford fan construction. So recall, um, so if we sort of go back up, let's go uh, back up to our fan construction. Do I have it somewhere here? So we, we had uh, here a tiling of R2 mod a lattice. So this is not a Kulikov degeneration because I would need it to be a complete triangulation. But if it was a complete triangulation, then it would satisfy the axioms of the Kulikov degeneration. So K would be trivial with simple normal crossings, central fiber, and smooth total space. And so um, instead of a complete triangulation of this real two torus, we're taking a complete triangulation of an integral affine structure on the um, two sphere. And, and what it tells us, so what it tells us is the central fiber X naught, right? It doesn't, um, it doesn't actually give us the smoothing of X naught to a smooth K3. Okay, so that's kind of a key, that's an important difference with the abelian variety case. So from, so from this picture, um, so from a, triangulated. So uh, we like to call them uh, IAS2s, integral affine spheres. Um, you can build um, a simple normal crossings surface, X naught um, glued from anti-canonical pairs. And then uh, there's just a, a sort of abstract theorem of Friedman. That X not smooths to a K3. Okay, so this is sort of the key piece, which is which is harder, sort of, in the K3 case. I mean, 
there are other things that are harder, which is that, for instance, you have these singularities, which is a which is a difference. Um, but but the what you don't have is an explicit construction of xt of the smoothing. So there um, you don't have an explicit construction. And you also don't have um, a polytope construction. So remember, for the Mumford degeneration, um, we had two constructions of the um, of a sort of degeneration. Um, one was this fan construction. The other was the polytope construction. So the fan construction. Uh, what what exists is the fan construction of the central fiber. Okay, so that's the piece that we still have for K3s. Though to be fair, this is something that um, uh, Gross, Hacking, Keel, um, who I mentioned above, and uh, and Zebert um, have been working on for for quite a while to replicate this polytope construction, but it's. Um, it's 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 just very very complicated because um, I mean you, you want to construct the analog of theta functions, um, but the problem is that it's not clear what the multiplication rule is for theta functions. So somehow, for the theta functions for the abelian variety, so if we just sort of go back to this uh, picture that we had of the Tate curve here. There was sort of a natural multiplication for the theta functions because we could sort of build the theta functions directly inside the um, power series ring in the two variables, and then we can view it just as a sub ring of the power series ring. Um, and to do the polytope construction for K3s, you kind of need to synthetically build the multiplication rule, um, which is not which is not easy. Okay. All right, so that is um, that's sort of what a Kulikov degeneration looks like, at least um, in in this uh, sort of rank of i equals one case. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to sort of um, get rid of that and just think of them like this. I mean, this is a much more concise way to represent the same data. Right. Um, this has exactly the same data as the as the red picture that I just deleted, right? Because I can reconstruct the surfaces by taking the fans of the individual components. Okay. So now let me sort of get to the um, to um, my joint work with Larry. So we we sort of define the notion of a polarizing divisor to be um, a choice of divisor R on the generic K3 surface. So by this X over C FD, I just mean the K3 surface over the generic point of the moduli space. Um, but you know, colloquially, this is just a choice of, of ample divisor on um, a Zariski open on the K3s in a Zariski open subset of the moduli space. So um, last time we, we sort of discussed this moduli space of, of stable pairs. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define a compactification of, um, of moduli of degree 2D K3s by just taking the closure of the K3 pairs, X epsilon R in the moduli space of stable pairs. So this is, um, so let me, I should mention X uh, epsilon R um, satisfies uh, KX plus epsilon R ample. Um, that was the sort of first property that we had. That's true just because KX is zero for a K3 surface, right? And so uh, by definition, uh, well, 
I should say that the generic K3 surface only has Picard rank one, and it's in the ample class, right? So any divisor on the generic K3 surface is automatically ample. And it satisfies this second property that the pair uh, has, has SLC singularities. Uh, so this is essentially just because, um, well, I've, I've sort of elided one thing about my K3s, I should be allowing them to have ADE singularities. And, um, but these ADE singularities, um, it's okay to have them, they're, they're examples of SLC singularities. And by taking my coefficient epsilon to be small, um, this doesn't sort of create any problems. Um, because, I mean, the sort of technical words to say there is that there's like, you, we need R to not go through any log canonical centers and um, there are no log canonical centers on, on an ADE K3 surface. So, so the point is that we get some geometric compactification by uh, stable K3s uh, by just taking the closure of the K3 pairs. And um, it would be nice to have an explicit description of this uh, moduli space. And that's sort of what the next theorem is about, but we're gonna need to impose assumption on our so-called choice of polarizing divisor. So, so let me let me introduce the following definition. So I say that this choice of divisor R is, is recognizable. This is sort of the key definition. Um, if it extends to a unique divisor on any Kulikov surface. So the sort of picture here is that I have like a, imagine that I have like a Kulikov surface, here's like zero, and I have a Kulikov surface X zero. And now I can smooth X zero in all of these different ways. I can like smooth it into different families of smooth K3s. But the point is that, um, and so I have a choice of divisor R um, sub T on all of these families. And for any one parameter family, I can just take the Zariski closure of the RTs. There's a, there's a flat limit of the curves RT. Um, but what this is saying is that those flat limits are not varying on X naught, right? So what it's saying is that the choice of divisor can be made on any Kulikov surface. In, in, so this is including smooth K3s. This is including um, any smooth K3. Because uh, by that definition, if, if of a Kulikov degeneration, um, like a just a smooth family of K3s sort of satisfies those axioms that the central fiber is simple and normal crossings and the total space is smooth. So the theorem um, that Valeri and I posted to the archive uh, a couple months ago is that if a divisor R, a canon if a choice of polarizing divisor is recognizable, then there is some unique semi-fan F sub R such that the um, semi-toroidal compactification associated to that semi-fan is the normalization of the stable pair compactification. So this relates on the one side, a Hodge theoretic compactification of degree two DK3s with a um, quote geometric compactification, something parameterizing um, stable pairs. And so I haven't told you what, a, what is a, um, semi toroidal compactification. So let's recall. Um, so these were um, these were introduced by Luyenga, and they're a simultaneous generalization of the toroidal and the Bailey Burrell compactifications. So they contain sort of both as uh, examples. Okay, so um, let's recall that associated to a K3 degeneration, we had this. Um, lambda, which was the tuple lambda one through lambda 19, um, which was sort of measuring the rate at which periods decayed. So the theorem of Friedman and Scatone is that the square of lambda is in fact the number of triple points of um, a Kulikov model. This is a Kulikov 
model. And um, so what is this F sub R? Uh, combina the combinatorial data that you need to define one of these semi-toroidal compactifications is a um, gamma delta invariant decomposition of the positive cone of this lattice, delta perp mod delta. And recall we said that this lattice had signature 118. So the positive cone is like, um, I guess, what is it called? Like the future, the future light cone or whatever in the relativity language. You know, it's like a sort of convex cone um, of positive, one of the two connected components of the positive norm vectors. And what we need is a, um, a polyhedral decomposition of that, which is invariant under the, um, the action of the stabilizer. So this is the, this is my notation for the stabilizer. In, in gamma of delta. Um, we need an invariant decomposition of that positive cone. And so uh, the reason why is because, so recall that we had a, the torus embedding, right? So we had the torus embedding like D mod the unipotent group. This was the first partial quotient into C star to the 19. Well, this C star to the 19 is sort of canonically identified with this delta perp mod delta tensored with C star, where um, a degeneration with um, so-called monodromy invariant lambda was approximated by the co-character lambda tensor C star. Um, and so this is, a, this is sort of the torus into which we're embedding. And so we can extend that torus by a toric variety whose fan is supported in the, um, whose fan is in this lattice, delta perp mod delta. So that's exactly what this FR is. And so I've slightly like, I'm brushing another thing under the rug, which is, what does this semi mean? The semi means is just related to this word locally, polyhedral. So if I have an actual polyhedral tiling, that would be, um, what would be called a fan, and you know what was studied by Ash Mumford, Rappaport, Ty. But um, I could take just a locally polyhedral decomposition. So, for instance, the cones might have infinitely many rational polyhedral walls. Um, so, uh, or for instance, the Bailey Burrell compactification is the decomposition of the positive cone, which is just the whole positive cone. Um, so. Uh, that's sort of how you get this wide range of behaviors for these um, semi toroidal compactifications. And then roughly this compactification um, associated to the semi-fan is to take the toric variety and then quotient by um, the action of the stabilizer of delta. So let me sort of... All right, so that at least describes, so now we've at least described the left and right hand sides of this um, equation. Okay, so that's nice, but like this is a completely useless theory if you can't prove the existence of recognizable divisors, right? Like otherwise, you know, you maybe it's a vacuous theorem, maybe there are no recognizable divisors on the generic K3. So um, the sort of second theorem in our paper is that this rational curve divisor, which is the sum of the rational curves in the polarization class, is a recognizable divisor. This is for um, all degrees 2D. And so this sort of provides for the existence of at least some um, like sort of toroidal compactification. Um, or semi toroidal compactification, rather, which has like a geometric meaning. Are there questions uh, about that so far, about the statements or otherwise? So, in here, C can be singular. So, I yeah, know. exactly. So, right. So, so um, C has to be singular because the arithmetic genus, right? The arithmetic genus of C 
is is given by um well i guess it's uh like one plus one half of l squared or something so it's one plus d right so all of these curves in the linear system of l have the same arithmetic genus by rational i mean that um, the normalization of c is p1 and then there's a sort of second hidden thing here which is that even defining this requires a pretty difficult theorem of uh, Shi Chen's, which says that um, on a sufficiently generic polarized K3 surface, the um, every rational curve is an irreducible curve with simple nodes, uh, with the number of simple nodes being this exactly this arithmetic genus, one plus D. So, so that says that there exists that Zariski open set right we needed a Zariski open set where we were defining our divisor um so to even say what that Zariski open set is we're what we're saying is that it's the set where every rational curve uh, every curve whose normalization is it say a disjoint union of p1s in the linear system um there exists a Zariski open set where in fact they satisfy those conditions i said um does that uh, make sense? Yes, thank you. And maybe I should also mention, so a famous theorem of, um, of Yao and Zaslow, um, Yao, Zaslow, also um, Beauville, so for, for more mathematical proof, um, is that, um, this rational curve divisor is in a certain explicit multiple of the polarization class. Um, this n sub d is is equal to um, the number of twenty four colored partitions um, of d. And these famously, um, if you sort of arrange them in a power series, n sub d q to the d, they are um, they give one over the modular discriminant. So that's this uh, beautiful Yao Zaslow formula. Um, but yeah, so what this is saying roughly is that even on a Kulikov surface, a degenerate Kulikov surface, there's a notion of the rational curves on it. And I can take their sum and I get some divisor on a Kulikov surface. Um, which is always the limit of the sum of the rational curves, no matter how I smoothed my Kulikov surface. Okay, so let me give uh, two sort of other examples of recognizable divisors. Um, so uh, the sort of first paper where we studied this was uh, with Alan Thompson um, when we considered degree two K3 surfaces. So a generic degree two K3 surface is a two to one branched cover over a sextic of P2 branched over a sextic with the line bundle being the uh, pullback of O of one. And there's a very canonical choice of polarizing divisor, which is the ramification divisor of the map. Um, so you can sort of compute that, well, um, it's one half of the pullback of the sextic curve, and therefore it's in three times um, the pullback of O of one. So this is a nice small multiple of the polarization. Um, and so this is recognizable, which means that there exists, um, so that should be an R, there exists a semi-fan, um, the ramification semi-fan, um, and if I take the compactification of the, um, with respect to the ramification semi-fan, it'll be the normalization of um, the uh, stable pair compactification for the ramification divisors. And this fan is um, an explicit coarsening of the Coxeter fan. So those are the, um, the Coxeter fan are the root perpendiculars in delta perp mod delta. And uh, you take a certain subset of the walls of that, and that's the semi-fan. And another interesting thing about this is that this one is definitely a semi-fan, not a fan. 
there are infinite polyhedral chambers of this. So, so you can't sort of strengthen our theorem to get rid of the word semi. Okay, so here's a picture of the K3 surface. So by now we understand that K3 surfaces, singular K3 surfaces can be described by integral affine structures on the sphere. So now what I do is I take this picture and you know I'm gonna triangulate it completely into lattice triangles of area one half. Etc. And then I'm going to replace each vertex here with um, uh, with a surface whose fan is what I sort of locally see. Okay, I need to describe that what's happening at the boundary. What I'm really doing here is I'm taking um, this thing times two and and gluing. So. Oh, well, yeah, maybe before I do that, sorry. First, I'm sort of gluing these two together. So I take this, this side of the cut and I glue it to the other side of the cut by a unit shear. This is a unit shear. And it introduces a singularity of the affine structure at this point, this red point here. So I do that to each of these. So I sort of sew up the cuts. And then after sewing up the cuts, what I have is like this sort of 18 gone. It's an integral affine structure on a disc with three singularities inside. And then I take those two things, I take two copies of it and I glue them along the equator. So I sort of just double the construction. So I just sort of fatten this thing up like that. Okay, but as you can sort of see, there's a bend here in the in this polygon right so if I just take a second copy of the polygon and I try to glue them again there's an angular defect right and so I then need to shear to glue them together. So that introduces 18 singularities along the equator so there's 18 singularities on, along the equator. Um, and then there's three in the northern hemisphere coming from these three. And then there's three sort of mirror ones in the Southern hemisphere. And so in the end, I get an integral affine structure on the sphere with 24 singularities. Okay, so that's sort of the picture of the Kulikov model. And as you can sort of see this integral affine structure on the sphere, it has an involution, right? Which is to flip the Northern and Southern hemispheres, okay? So this involution is going to act on all of these components. If I choose my triangulation to be involution invariant, it's going to act on the surface X naught that I build. So X naught is going to have an involution iota, not maybe. And it's going to have a ramification divisor. Well, if it sends a component in the northern hemisphere to one in the southern hemisphere, then certainly the only ramification of this involution would be along the equator. Right, so this blue, this blue here denotes like the sort of tropical ramification divisor. In fact, it's the dual complex of the limit of the ramification divisor. So the blue um, is equal to to this thing. Um, so this extra additional data of a graph. So this blue is is a graph embedded into the integral affine sphere. And we call this like a sort of, it's like a tropical polarization, tropical polarizing rather divisor. And um, so the point here is that from this surface X naught, we can actually determine the limit of the, um, of the fixed locus of the involution just from the bare geometry of X naught. X naught alone determines R naught, the limit of the divisor, and it's, it's just equal to um, like the fixed locus of this involution. So, that, so this implies recognizability, right? Because we said that something is recognizable if, um, 
if on a given Kulikov surface, the um, the you can make the choice of divisor even on a Kulikov surface, and here you can um, as the fixed locus of this involution. Are there questions about this picture? Well, maybe I'll show you the elliptic K3 picture and then and then we can go back and see if there's any questions. So, so let me sort of, so this is joint work with um, Adrian Brunete. Um, so it's proving a, a something that he conjectured in his thesis about the structure of uh, compactification of elliptic K3s. So an elliptic K3 is an elliptic fibration um, with a section S and fiber class F um, with 24 singular fibers. And uh, this is not an example of an F2D because there's the generic Picard group will be ranked two, generated by S and F. And generically, there are 24 singular fibers. Let's call them F1 through F24. And then the theorem is that uh, R sing, which is the section plus the sum of some multiple of the singular fibers is recognizable for all M. And um, this fan F R sing refines the coxeter chamber. So again, um, this is a reflective lattice and it has a coxeter chamber. And this fan refines that maximal chamber into nine subchambers. And so that ends up being the fan. So this is nice because this is actually a fan, not a semi-fan, actually a fan, not a semi-fan. Well, not, not strictly a semi-fan. Okay. Um, so let me now just show you what is the tropical elliptic K3. Okay, so... Um, so we're going to do the same thing where we sort of triangulate this completely into lattice triangles of area one half, replacing each vertex with a surface. And then you can sort of, so I haven't built a sphere yet. So what I do is I sort of glue this thing to this thing, this thing, this thing, like this. So I sort of identify these vertical segments by a vertical shear by a vertical shear. Um, and you can note that this integral affine sphere has a circle vibration, an S1 vibration, right? Because if we take this segment, then the bottom and the top of the segment get glued. So this is an S1 vibration. And this is the tropicalization of the elliptic vibration. And then these blue vertical things are the limits of the singular fibers. And this blue horizontal thing is the limit of the segment of the section. Okay, so I uh, was going to do a proof outline if I sort of had time at the end, but seeing as I've seemingly just filled up my time, uh, maybe I should stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any question or comment? Um, I have one question. Is the in the Loyanka compactifications that you get, is there any obvious toroidal refinement of that compactification? Any obvious toroidal resolution, rather? Well, so every every um, semi-toroidal compactification has some toroidal refinement, certainly. Um, it's not clear that like sort of, I mean, it would be interesting to see whether, one thing that we don't know is like, if you range over all recognizable divisors, which semi-fans do you get? Like maybe all of the semi-fans you get are dominated by some single toroidal compactification, which supports like all geometric compactifications. But I would sort of expect that not to be true actually. Okay. I expect that sort of, for instance, you can, there's this natural class of, so we can define RRC of M to be the sum over the C in M times the polarization C rational 
of C. So these are these are all also all recognizable. And my sort of expectation is that, like, as you take the sort of corresponding fans, semi fans F R C M, that they just get finer and finer. So I would sort of expect that there isn't really any given toroidal compactification which is dominating all of these over all M. Because like these, we sort of know that, for instance, that the rational curves are dense in the K3 surface. And the analog here would be that these tropical blue curves are becoming dense in the integral affine sphere. And so um, the sort of combinatorics, I think, might be changing. You know, um, it's the fans are getting finer and finer, would be my guess. But I don't know. Like, the other thing is that, see, these two theorems with uh, Brunete and with Thompson are nice because we explicitly computed the fan in both cases. But with this theorem, where we just do the abstract existence result, and for the rational curve divisor, that it's recognizable, I guess, yeah, here. We don't know what the, we, we haven't computed the fan and we don't, really don't know actually how to compute it. So this is one piece that's kind of missing. In the abelian variety case, you know, you had the second Voronoi fan for the theta divisor. Um, but here there is this rational curve semi fan, but we don't really know how to compute it because it's like, it's a really complicated divisor, you know? <laughs> it's in a huge multiple, for instance, of the polarization. The number of 24 colored partitions of D is, uh, is, is gigantic. Um, the only thing that we do know about this sort of, which maybe would be, um, maybe it is some weak evidence for, for what you're saying, um, is that we can compute what this is on the unigonal locus. So elliptic K3s embed, Right, so um, F elliptic embeds into F two D uh, for all D, where um, the line bundle becomes the section plus D plus one times the fiber, and then this R sync is proportional theorem of um, um, Leung and. Uh, Brian and Leung, I think, um, the rational curves on an elliptic K3 give um, some multiple of this, of this divisor. And so we know, we know what FRC is restricted to the unigonal hyperplane. Uh, it's always equal to um, this subdivision of uh, this 2117 into nine subchambers. But we, we sort of, just because you know it on a hyperplane doesn't mean you know it. And you know it on an 18 dimensional sub lattice, not on the whole 19 dimensional lattice. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's an interesting question though. Um, yeah, like how do, you, how do you actually compute it? So any other question or comment? Actually, can I ask you a question? Sure, yeah. Yeah, so can you, how can I say, describe how, in principle, how this recognizable divisor restricted to this Kuliko, this, I mean, this singular fiber? Oh yeah, like how do you actually describe it? Yeah. So, so we sort of described it in this case, right? Yeah, it was yeah. the fixed locus of the involution. Yeah. In this case, it's sort of similar. So, so this thing has a vibration over a, a chain of P1s. And uh, like, if you look, there's a special set of fibers. So for instance, over a given component, there's a generic, generically it's a cycle maybe, maybe there's like 72 rational curves forming a giant cycle. But sometimes the, those 72 curves break into a cycle of 73. So we call those the very singular fibers. There are fibers of this broken elliptic vibration that are more singular than their neighbors. And those are necessarily the limits of the singular fibers on the smooth elliptic K3. So again, from the bare geometry of X naught, one can read off what is necessarily the limit of the singular fibers. 
Okay. And then for the rational curve divisor, so the one that works for all degree, um, there's this notion, um, there's this notion of, a, of an admissible. Okay, so first of all, maybe remark is that um, every component of this Kulikov surface is rational, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there are lots of rational curves on it. They move freely, you know, in positive dimensional families, et cetera, et cetera. They're not rigid like on a K3, but there is a notion of a rational curve, which is rigid. So this is the notion of a so-called admissible stable map. Stable genus zero map. So what it is, is it's, it's a map from some nodal rational curve, a tree of P1s um, to our Kulikov surface is like this triangulated sphere, uh, which sort of, it, it has to satisfy a certain like tangency condition. It says that um, if I have like two components mapping to adjacent components here, then uh, the sum of the tangency orders on the two sides has to be the same. So they have to be tangent to equal order. And these objects, these sort of objects are rigid, or sorry, they're images, the images, the image of such a map um, is rigid. And so this is sort of what um, abstractly, we sort of know that the limit of the rational curve divisor is some sum of images of admissible stable genus zero maps. Um, and that's what sort of, certifies recognizability for this x naught. I see. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. This is a cool picture, by the way, of uh, this. These are elliptic curves inside, um, immersed into this degree 2k3 surface. Oh, sort of closed periodic trajectories. <laughs> cool. Pretty, yeah. Did you draw it? I mean, a computer program drew it, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so yeah, if, if you sort of, if you glue the two halves, you know, you can kind of like shine light and then make it keep going on the, on the thing on the other side. Oh. And then it bounces around and it actually comes back. And what this ends up being is a, is a gigantic chain of rational curves immersed into the uh, singular K3. And then that deforms to, to an elliptic K3. But an interesting thing is that you get these irrational trajectories, which I don't know what their geometric meaning is mm. um, because they certainly have no naive geometric meaning, you know, yeah. but they must be something like this orange thing is limiting to an irrational trajectory, a rational closed trajectory. Oh, I see, I see. And can I have one more question? Indeed. I, oh, yeah. I'm, afraid it, I, I'm asking too many questions. No, it's fine. Please, yeah. <laughs> so, is is it how can I say? Can maybe you omitted that, but I mean, how can how can it describe map between this geometry compactification and this hot theory compactification? So yeah. So the proof, the sort of outline is that. Um, so so the point was that. Is since we have this R naught uh, contained in X naught, this unique divisor, what we do is we sort of take the space of all pairs of X R, where X is Kulikov, possibly smooth, yeah. possibly smooth. And now, um, so there's a moduli space of these kind of, the way to think about this moduli space is that it's sort of the infinite toroidal, uh, toroidal blow up. So uh, Kulikov surfaces come in these 19 dimensional families. So there was that C start of the 19, which is sort of at the boundary of the period domain in a given um, direction um, for a given sort of unipotent matrix. And so, the way to think about this compactification is that we have like F2D and then there's sort of 
these boundary divisors and you just keep blowing up successively. So it's not a finite type object. It's like sort of the infinite blow up. Um, and given any degeneration, it will hit one of these because every degeneration has a Kulikov model. Yeah, yeah. So that's sort of the, now the, the sort of point is that from XR, um, you can build the, the log canonical model, which is just proj, the direct sum of like O, X, and R. This is the log, this is the log canonical model. Yeah. Um, and it defines a map from this gigantic non-finite type compactification to um, this uh, stable pair compactification. Mm. And now what you do is you, you can prove that the strata of this are, um, are, are quasi-affine. The type three strata of this are quasi-affine. And, and from that sort of abstract fact, you can actually prove, so first of all, it's an infinite type thing mapping to this finite type thing. It's gonna factor through some finite type thing. And the fact that the type two, uh, type three strata are quasi-affine means that it factors through a toroidal compactification. So there's some toroidal compactification which dominates this. That's the first major step. And then the second step is to prove that every compactification dominated by a toroidal one is semi-toroidal. Mm -hmm. So this is just a sort of abstract fact about semi-toroidal compactifications, which you know nobody really noticed. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they're closed under taking normal images. Mm -hmm. And so that's sort of the key uh, thing. I see. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. So, other questions or comments? Okay, if not, let's thank to the speaker for a wonderful talk. So we will resume at yeah ten thirty, so from about twenty minutes later. Yeah, and if you yeah, so see you soon. <laughs>